Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks very much for having me here today in Esberg, Denmark. It's a real pleasure and honour to be here as we work together. Now, that video always brings out a lot of emotion in me. It's filmed in the Kumbu Valley, which is the main valley that leads up to Mount Everest in Nepal, in the Himalayas. I've spent a lot of my life in that area. I've had the most fantastic adventures of my life in that area. I've formed some, some lifelong friendships there. And you can understand, it's a stunningly beautiful environment. Climbing up on those large mountains is, it's, it's, it's life-affirming. It's also incredibly addictive, but it's certainly not worth dying for. And that's what we're here for today. We're here to talk about doing work that we love doing, but work that is not worth dying for. One of the great things about being a mountaineering speaker is that you get to quote such literary luminaries as Ernest Hemingway. He once said, there are but three true sports, motor racing, mountain climbing, and bullfighting. All the rest are merely games. I love that quote. I suspect that the organisers of the annual conference are perhaps Ernest Hemingway readers as well. Last year we had Formula One, this year mountaineering, so my money's on us maybe having a bullfighter next year speaking. <laughs> now, there is a very important date in my life, the 17th of May 2010. It's the most important day in my life. My wife disagrees. She reckons the day that we got married should be the most important date in my life, or alternatively, the day that our beautiful daughter Lily was born, that that should, should be the most important date in my life. But for me, this is it, because it's when I was fortunate enough to be able to stand, or at that point in time, sit on the summit of Mount Everest. I was pretty tired, as you can well imagine. And that was more than 10 years in the making to be able to stand on the summit of Everest. So I've climbed Mount Everest, but so what? How is that relevant for us here today in the oil and gas industry? So first, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context about me, who I am and what I do and what I've done. So at university, I studied psychology, anthropology and geography. I'm from Perth, Western Australia, and in the early days, we had quite a, or, well, not burgeoning, quite a large oil and gas industry. And so for about 15 years, I've worked primarily in that sector. So I've worked on some of the larger scale LNG projects, such as the Gorgon project. That's a three train liquids to natural gas project drilling in about 200 metres of water, and also the Wheatstone project. Similar sized um, project, both, both Chevron um, LNG plants. So I've led multidisciplinary teams of scientists, engineers, uh, planners to help gain regulatory approval for these large-scale large -scale gas plants. So it's from that perspective that I comment on leadership um, and safety leadership. Um, but it's also from this other perspective, that as a mountaineer, and so I guess I'm bringing a slightly different, um, a different perspective today. So subsequent to climbing Mount Everest, one of my jobs now is to actually work as an expedition leader. I helped set up a Nepali-based guiding company with my Nepali friends, and we now actually run expeditions into the mountains. So it's sort of from this dual perspective that, that I'm presenting to you today. So looking at ideas of leadership, teamwork, and safety. I don't think you can really separate any of these three. I think they, you have to look at them as a whole. Because if we want to do the work that we want to do, we need to be led well, we need to work effectively in our teams, and we need to ensure that we're doing it safely. So I normally present these ideas, whether it's actually to guys working out on the job, on the tools, whether it's back in head offices, and even sometimes I actually do some experiential learning in the outside environment. I find the outdoor environment to be a very, very powerful um, environment to learn about oneself and to learn about your fellow team members. This is um, a course I run in the, in the southwest of Western Australia. It's on the only mountain range we have in Western Australia. Likewise, it's a very, very flat state, quite similar to us here in Denmark. 
Now, I work with this concept of VUCA. Has anybody in the room come across this term before? If you're British, you might use the word VUCA. VUCA, VUCA, same thing. So it's an acronym. Has its origins with the US military. At the end of the Cold War, late 1980s, early 1990s, the US military suddenly found themselves in a new paradigm, a new environment, one in which they were not particularly familiar with. They'd gone from being in a bilateral landscape, the West versus the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union came apart and all of a sudden, overnight seemingly, it was a multilateral landscape. So they had many different potential enemies, some unseen, some non-state entities. And Islamic State is a, is, is a classic example of that. So they realised very quickly that the US military, which had become a very large, somewhat cumbersome organisation, needed to, needed to shift, shift its mindset. And this, this word VUCA is the, the, the one descriptive word they came up with to, to, um, to get everybody used to this new, this new world order, so to speak. And I love this term of VUCA because I think it um, describes better than any other environment what we do as mountaineers. Of course, I forgot to actually describe what VUCA stands for. That's for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So as a mountaineer, we need to be very comfortable in this VUCA environment. If you're not comfortable in a VUCA world, you're, not gonna, you're probably not gonna be very successful as a mountaineer. But I think the VUCA environment actually extends further than the military and mountaineers. I think it's relevant to all of us, and particularly all of us in organisations today. We all know that the world is changing quite radically at the moment. It's changing very, very quickly. And if organisations are not able to be comfortable in this VUCA environment, it's questionable whether they'll actually be relevant in the next five to ten years. So essentially I see it like there's a, a shift, there's a transition underway. We're going from the old world order, which is one of stability, certainty, simplicity and clarity, to a new world order of volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. What are the causes of this shift to VUCA? I reckon it's primarily three things. It's globalisation, radically changing the way we do our business. It's political and social relationships, which are radically changing as well at the moment. And of course, thirdly, and what underpins every other reason, is the rate of technological innovation. So we know with Moore's law, the idea that every 18 months, the power of a computer chip will double. It's basically leading us to an exponential growth rate of technology which is fantastic, but the problem is that us as human beings, we don't evolve that quickly. And so we're becoming incredibly uncomfortable in this VUCA world. We're not used to dealing with this rate of change. So with this shift comes a change from comfort to discomfort. So I think we need to get comfortable getting uncomfortable, ourselves individually and also in our organisations today. So what are the problems with VUCA from an organisational perspective? Well, firstly, nobody likes it. When things are volatile, uncertain, ambiguous, does that sound like an environment in which you're going to be at ease? Not really. Secondly, it leads to people underperforming. When you're facing a deluge of information, of uncertainty, what's the most likely human response? It's to retreat to retreat from your environment. If I'm on a mountain and a storm is descending on us, what am I going to do? My natural inclination is going to be to retreat from it, to get away from it as quickly as I can. So people, sorry, VUCA leads to people disengaging from their work that they're doing. And disengaged workers, by uh, engagement, I'm talking about people being psychologically committed to their work. Disengaged workers are more at risk of having accidents, and the statistics tell us that. They're at a greater risk of having a workplace accident. So I started getting really interested in this idea around engagement. Now, I've seen 
teams run the full spectrum, both in organisations and also on the mountain, from being fully engaged to not being engaged at all. And I got really curious, well, what is it about some teams that enables them to perform so well? What is it about other teams that doesn't enable them to do that? The statistics around employee engagement worldwide are, are pretty scary. I'm sure some of us in the room have come across the Gallup organisation's engagement survey results. From 2013, these numbers on the left here based on the American workplace show us that only 30% of the American workplace is engaged in the work that they're doing, is psychologically committed to the work that they're doing. 50% being disengaged and a 20% being actively disengaged. So from an individual perspective, I think you can call those people destructive. They actually hate working in that place. And if they're working in a team, they're not going to be up for doing the, the work that you need them to do. So this interest for me is really what drives most of what I do. How can we make our people in our teams, whether they're in organisations or whether they're in mountaineering teams, become more engaged? And it's not that simple. You can't simply install a plug-in and make a worker more engaged. But I think we need to be quite realistic. In a lot of our organisations, I see people who really are at this bottom level. They're destructive. They're uncomfortable. And I, these are, now this might sound harsh, but I think these are the cancer of the workplace. And I think we really need to be quite smart about getting these people out of our teams and at the very least having um, uh, just uh, disengaged people who, uh, as, as the very, very minimum. So the solution to all this, to our disengaged workforce, to our disengaged people, what is it? Well, as I said, it's to get comfortable getting uncomfortable. So then I started thinking, well, OK, how do we do that? Who can we learn from? And it occurred to me that there's a group of people who have been doing this for quite a long time, who have been getting comfortable being uncomfortable. That's, of course, explorers. Since the early days, whether it be Arctic exploration, Himalayan exploration, desert exploration, you generally have to be OK with being uncomfortable. So what are the three key core elements of an explorer and, and adopting an explorer's mindset? Well, first of all, I think you need to know what your drive and your motivation is. Because if you're not driven, if you're not motivated, it's not going to happen for you. You need to be flexible and adaptable to that ever-changing VUCA environment. And you also need to be open and curious to that outside world, but also to your internal world, particularly around yourself, so self-awareness is really important if you are to be an accessful, a successful explorer. Now, focusing a little bit more in on mountaineering specifically, there's traditionally two types of mountaineering that we can do. The first style of mountaineering, it's called alpine style. This developed in the Alps um, in the early 1900s, and this involves basically a very lightweight style of climbing. Two climbers climbing together tied into a rope carrying the minimal amount of equipment they'll need to get up, climb the mountain, and get back down before the weather changes. So alpine style. It's lean, it's agile, but it's very risky. The alternative is called expedition style. And this style of climbing developed in the Himalayas in the 1950s. And this is basically how most Himalayan climbing happens today. The Himalayas are much higher than any other mountain range on Earth, and they have very low levels of oxygen and atmospheric pressure. And as such, you need to spend a lot of time acclimatising on the mountain, which means you need um, extra equipment, which means you need a lot of manpower. So the standard sort of default uh, strategy for climbing large Himalayan mountains has been expedition style. It's basically lay siege to the mountain. So it's quite effective. It's very powerful but it's also very cumbersome. It's such a big concept that it's difficult to change quickly. And in the Himalayas, the problem is, is that things can change very quickly. What happens with expedition-style climbing these days? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't end particularly well, as we've seen in recent years. Just last year, more than 500 people having to be airlifted from the Himalayas with 43 deaths when a very, very predictable storm moved in from the Bay of Bengal, moved northwards and dumped a lot of snow on the Himalayas. Now, the people caught 
in this storm were not mountaineers, they were trekkers. They were doing a walk called the, the Annapurna Circuit. That doesn't, doesn't include technical climbing. You don't need uh, ropes or ice axe or crampons or anything like that. But nonetheless, 43 people lost their lives. And we're seeing this more and more in the Himalayas today, problems with this expedition style of, of trekking and climbing. It's too big and cumbersome. It's not able to react quick enough. Even more scary is the actual commercial climbing we're seeing in the Himalayas. These are expeditions that are run by private entities. So in, in, in the earlier days of expedition climbing, your, your teams were basically comprised of, of national teams. So it might be that Denmark was launching an expedition to Mount Everest, it would be sponsored by the government to put the first Dane on the summit of Everest. These days it's different. Basically, if you've got the money, if you can afford it, then the private company will let you on. And you can see from this website here, this is a Canadian guy by the name of Tim Ripple. Peak Freaks, his company is called. This could be you. The website tells us, near the summit of Mount Everest, of course, only for 48 and a half thousand US dollars. Now, when I was on Everest in 2010, I met a couple of people from Tim's climbing team. On Mount Everest, the highest mountain on earth, did these people have any previous experience? No. So they'd come to Mount Everest to learn how to mountaineer, which is quite appalling. I'd spent 10 years preparing for my Mount Everest climb and I had expected to be one of the uh, least experienced climbers on the mountain, but I actually found out that I was one of the most experienced climbers, so I was really quite surprised by that. Now, one of the big problems with this commercial climbing in the Himalayas, people paying a lot of money to be there, means that they're not actually doing all the hard work themselves. A lot of that money is being directed to teams of Sherpa climbers, so Sherpas being the local ethnic group there who are very skilled, competent climbers. A lot of the hard work goes to the Sherpas who carry lots of loads, they stock the camps, they get the route ready so the paying clients can climb up to the summit. So they are exposed to uh, much greater risk. They're exposed to these dangerous conditions on the mountain, um, probably about, their exposure is probably about 10 times greater than the paying client. And what are the outcomes of that? Well, almost a year to the day, last year we saw this. An avalanche on Mount Everest which killed 16 climbers. It wasn't, an un, it wasn't a random event. Avalanches occur pretty regularly. But it just happened on a morning where there were 16 Sherpas carrying a load of stuff up on the route for their commercial clients. And this hurts me qu quite a lot because a very good friend of mine was one of the guys killed, Aang Kaji Sherpa. Now, Aang and I had climbed Everest together. Aang had actually climbed Everest four times. He's a father of six children and he's no longer with us today. So this commercial type of climbing which occurs in the Himalayas, I, th I guess I'm almost embarrassed to tell you this because compared to what Mark Gallagher was speaking about last year, we're you know, decades behind. A Sherpa working on Mount Everest is three and a half times more likely to lose their life doing their job than an American soldier was in the first four years of the Iraq war that began in 2003. So three and a half times more likely to lose their life. So this is an example of an industry which is not regulated. It's in Nepal, it's a very, very poor country. Money has a lot of power. I hope that last year's avalanche was the line in the sand that Mark spoke about. I feel that it is. And um, I guess I look forward to change, but with, with some trepidation. So I started thinking, well, look, there's got to be a better way of doing this. Alpine style, it doesn't really work in the Himalayas. Expedition style, it leads to novice climbers trying to climb when they shouldn't be in the mountains. So what if we can blend that approach? What if we can take the best elements of Alpine style, about being lightweight and agile, and combine them with the best elements of expedition style, which is using enough force to climb the mountain. And so I actually set about this, setting up this 
guiding company with my Nepali friends. It's called Himalayan Ascent. And the ethos around this was not big, large commercial expeditions. On, on, on your large commercial expeditions, you're talking, with, um, you're talking about potentially up to 30 paying clients. So Tim Ripple's company would take 30 clients a year, each paying 48,500 US dollars. So if you work out the revenue, Tim Ripple is sitting quite pretty there. But a team of 30 is far, far too big and cumbersome. So this blended style is a better way of doing it. We're talking about teams of four or five people. We're talking about climbers operating as equals. So when I'm climbing, I'm operating on the same level as my Sherpas. There's no sort of hierarchy there. So I think that this is the way to do things in the mountains. And I also think that this blended kind of approach is the way that we need to work in our organisations as we adapt to this VUCA environment. Now, I'm a big fan of DuPont's Bradley Curve. I particularly love it because I, I, it's, I find it to be very insightful and particularly with regard to mountaineering and where I see where teams actually fit. And I can map my own progress as a mountaineer via the Bradley Curve. When I started out, I was very much reactive. I didn't really know what I was doing and I just reacted to what I perceived to be an incredibly dangerous environment. Then in the mid-2000s, I started joining commercial expeditions myself. So that was where I was a paying team member. So I learnt how to climb, but ultimately I realised that wasn't going to work for me because I would find myself in teams of climbers with people who had never been climbing before and I was not prepared to take that risk. So in 2009 and 2010, I was climbing in very, very small teams, normally just myself and one of my Sherpa friends. And then subsequent to that, this bottom row here where we're interdependent, that is the company that we've formed where we're using that blended style. So I've moved in my own mountaineering career from being reactive to being dependent, independent and interdependent. So how do we actually do it? How do we climb a mountain or how do we work towards a business goal in a VUCA world? Well, there's a framework that I've been using myself for about 10 years. Basically, this was the framework I developed when I was working towards climbing Mount Everest. It's a, it's a framework that I use also within organisations today. I'm going to walk you through this framework and I'm going to use the mountaineering analogy here. So first of all, I will have decided, OK, this is the particular mountain that I want to climb. So I'm going to identify the approach. How are we actually going to get there? What's it going to look like? Are we going to climb large expedition style? Is it going to be alpine style? Is it going to be that blended approach? Then I'll build the team. So who's on board? I've been on a lot of teams of climbers where um, you know, I guess you're spending one to two months with each other and the team dynamics haven't worked. And that can provoke, create a very toxic environment and a toxic environment is also a very unsafe environment. So I'm very cautious around building that team. And then I start that sense-making process. What's out there? And from that day forward, once I've decided to climb the mountain, I'm trying to seek and gather as much data as I can about the climb. Um, I've got an absolute thirst for data about the mountain, about the route, about the weather, all those kinds of things so I can be as best prepared, as well, well armed as possible before I even step foot on the mountain. The next three stages, about getting set, this is when we start that creating the vision process. So what does it actually look like? So it's, we're not starting the vision from day one, we're doing a lot of homework first of all with those prior three steps. But when it does come to creating that vision, when I'm leading an expedition on the mountain, this is incredibly important for me. This is probably the most important or the equal most important element of this framework. Because I think if you can create a vision, if you can articulate it to your team members and if your team members buy into that vision, if they engage in it, it sets the standard for the rest of the expedition. Within a lot of organisations, I see vision statements which are not particularly well designed to connect with or to engage with people. I think a vision really needs to be something that you can engage in. My vision these days for any mountaineering expedition, it's the same as your industry, it's about getting home safely. How do I actually imagine that vision? For me, it's about getting uh, back to Perth, landing in Perth International Airport, the, the custom gates opening, and me seeing my wife and my daughter. That for me is a successful 
expedition. That is my vision for every expedition. We have a saying in mountaineering, come back alive, come back as friends, come back with the summit. So that's the level of, of priority. If you get the vision right, if you believe in the vision, getting the engagement is pretty easy. And building the resilience and grit is also pretty easy. Once we're underway, the other really important part is all around understanding what everybody, every individual's attitude towards risk is because this is where most fatalities happen in the mountain environment. I'll be delving into that in a little bit more detail. Always looking for opportunities to learn from the mistakes that we make and then finally thinking long term. I'm always trying to climb one mountain but I'm also thinking another one or two years out, what am I going to be doing beyond that? So I want to use um, probably the final six elements of this framework to tell you a couple of stories and to give you a better feel for what it's like actually climbing in the Himalayas. A lot of people say to me, well, Pat, you know, did you decide to climb Mount Everest? Was it from day one you decided that was what your vision was? And it wasn't. It wasn't until I think I'd been climbing for about eight years before I really decided that I wanted to try Everest. I was very fortunate that my mum and dad had a real love of the outdoors and they instilled that into all of their four kids. And so I was pretty comfortable moving around in the outdoors. When I was at university, I was very much an avid um, armchair mountaineer. So I'd be reading all the mountaineering books. And as a reward for finishing my university degree, I decided that I would actually take myself to the mountains of New Zealand and learn the basics, learn the basic technical skills that you need to have to be able to survive in, in, in this VUCA environment. This picture is actually taken on that climbing course. Interestingly, a copy of it takes pride of place over my mum and dad's dining room table. They're very proud of what their son has achieved. A number of their friends over these have commented, wow, is, is that your son? Jeez, he, he must be so brave, he must be so fearless. But they don't know the truth behind this photograph, and that is that there I am, huddled over my ice axe, sobbing, because the drop on either side was so steep, turns out I was terrified of heights. A slight impediment to my otherwise burgeoning mountaineering career. So initially, I was incredibly reactive. I just saw danger everywhere. This was an environment which was entirely foreign to me. I'm still very much afraid of heights, but I can deal with that fear a lot better because I'm much better at being able to differentiate a real hazard from something that might look dangerous but actually isn't. So I use mountaineering as a fantastic way to travel the world. Generally, once a year, I'd embark on another expedition to a different continent. This is a beautiful rock climb in the Canadian Rockies. In 2004, it was time for my first big Himalayan expedition. So to be climbing in the Himalayas, this is the benchmark testing ground for any high altitude mountaineer. It was very exciting for me. The mountain I'd chosen to climb was one called Spantic. It's 7,028 metres high. So a pretty big first time Himalayan objective. Spantic is located in a mountain range called the Karakoram, that's the western part of the Himalayas, and that's in Pakistan. Now in 2004, Pakistan was considered to be quite a dangerous country for Westerners to travel to, post 9-11 New York terrorist attack and the like. But I researched the area that we were travelling to in the northeast of the country, away from Afghanistan, closer to the border with China, and I felt that it should be pretty safe, and for the most part it was. Pakistan was an incredibly friendly and hospitable society. Their tourist trade had taken a massive hit post 9-11, and so they were incredibly appreciative of, of any visitors. Admittedly, there was one place, one town that we passed through that did feel somewhat hostile. As we drove down the main street, I remember the expressions um, on the faces of the villagers made it quite apparent that we really weren't welcome there. And so we got out of that town pretty quickly. I wasn't too surprised to find out in 2011 that that town called Abbottabad, is where Osama bin Laden was actually caught hiding. So it just so happens that we'd uh, stumbled across Osama's uh, temporary uh, residence. Now, we didn't summit this mountain. We only got about halfway up it. A big storm descended on the mountain. We had to get off it. And that was one of the really important early learnings of my career. We like to think that we're in control, but when you're on a mountain, very quickly you realise you don't have a lot of control at all. It's how you react to the events um, that dictates whether you stay alive or otherwise. 
But this is where my vision slowly kind of started forming in the background on this expedition. And in part, it was because of the, the calibre of my fellow team members. I was meeting some incredibly inspiring climbers. On the left of the photograph here is a Spanish climber by the name of Inigo. A year after this photograph was taken, he went on to tackle Mount Everest, getting to within 100 metres of the summit before having to turn around, again due to bad weather. But unperturbed by that, he returned to the Himalayas two years later, this time to tackle a mountain called Kanchenjunga. Now, Kanchenjunga is the third highest mountain on Earth. Inigo stood on the summit of Kanchenjunga, so very inspirational to me. But perhaps even more inspirational are the two young chaps to the right there, young Rob and James, two English boys. They're 17 at the time this photograph is taken. So they've convinced their folks to let them out of year 11 high school, travel from England to Pakistan to try and climb a 7,000 metre mountain. So obviously they were pretty good at convincing their parents about what it was they wanted to do. It was on this expedition that they revealed to me a secret that they too were headed for Mount Everest. So in 2004, the record for the youngest Brit to have summited Everest was held by none other than Bear Grylls. So Bear had climbed Everest at the age of 24. So Rob and James rather audaciously wanted to take that title off Bear. When they made their intentions known, when they made them public, and they needed to do that to try and acquire funding, they were roundly laughed at, scoffed at. People said, you're just 17-year-old kids. You don't know what you're doing. And whilst they were somewhat short in experience, they were incredibly driven, incredibly motivated. And two years later, at the age of 19, young Rob and James stood together on the summit of Mount Everest at the age of 19. And so I was incredibly inspired by this, and I thought, wow, I've, some of my friends are actually going out there and doing this. And so perhaps that's something that I'll be able to do one day. So the vision was slowly sort of starting to form in the background. Now, I spoke about the importance of getting that vision right, because if you get the vision right, it's then easier to get engaged in what you're trying to do. Remember, engagement being psychologically committed to the work that you're doing. Now, in Perth, we don't have a lot of mountains to climb. As I said before, it's a pretty flat state. So how do you train when you're not in the Himalayas? Well, you really just have to make do. Now, this might look like it's in the middle of the forest, but it's actually in the middle of a park called Kings Park in central Perth. We have two sets of stairs there. One's called Jacob's Ladder, the other called the Kokoda Steps. And this is where I would actually have to do a lot of my training. Now, as a comparison, it's about the same height as the Church of, of the Saviour in, in, in Copenhagen. So I would do up to 30 up and downs of this in one session. That would take about five hours to complete. To make it more realistic, what it's like carrying a heavy backpack on the mountain, I'd do it with a 25 kilogram dive tank on my back. So it'd take about five hours to do. I'd start at about 7 p.m. most weeknight evenings and go through until about midnight. So for two reasons, firstly because it was cooler in the evening hours and secondly, fewer people to see me walking up and down these stairs with a, with a dive tank on my back about 20 kilometres away from the ocean. So doing this repeated work, five hours of up and down, up and down, up and down is incredibly boring, it's incredibly mind-numbing. How do you actually do that? Would I go and do that right now? No, I, I don't think I could physically possibly but mentally I wouldn't be able to tolerate that but I don't have a vision that I'm working towards. Back then I did, and I knew that by doing this training, it was making me fitter, and it was making me stronger, and it was making my expedition safer. There was a greater chance of me coming home alive the, more f the, the fitter I was, and that really enabled me to do that hard work. So the benefits of being engaged in the work that you're doing is that it, it makes that hard work easy, or at least easier. It also enables us to build grit and resilience, and there's a lot of stuff happening in, in organisational development around resilience and grit at the moment. But again, like engagement, it's not something that you can simply just plug in, plug into your workforce. It has to develop over time, and I think, again, it goes back to having that vision right and having being engaged in that vision. So, I had really made up my mind by this point in time that I was headed for Everest. But I knew that I needed a lot more experience climbing at high altitude. Due to the low levels of oxygen and atmospheric pressure, 
it's completely different climbing at altitude to what it's like climbing on the lower mountain ranges of the world. So I knew that I needed to build up a resume, essentially, a skill set which would ultimately serve me uh, well on Everest. And so I identified, this was in 2006 now, I identified another four mountains that I thought I needed to climb before I would be ready for Mount Everest. So the next one was this one here, it's called Mount Amma de Blam. She stands at an altitude of 6,850 metres. So not particularly high, her summit is two vertical kilometres lower than Mount Everest, but what she lacks in sheer altitude she makes up for in steepness. An incredibly steep and technically difficult mountain to climb. When I first saw this view of the mountain from the, from the trek in, we are going to try and climb it via this right-hand skyline ridge. I think I may have started crying again. I was so horrified at how steep this route looked. But I didn't need to worry about my fear of heights because I didn't get anywhere near the summit. At a lower altitude of about 6,000 metres, I developed a very serious altitude illness. This is known as high-altitude pulmonary edema, where again, due to the lack of atmospheric pressure, fluid leaks out of your bodily cells and it accumulates in your lungs. And so you effectively start drowning in your own bodily fluids, even though I'm six vertical kilometres above sea level. So it's a very insidious disease. The onset is very acute, very quick. You become incredibly fatigued. If I had pulmonary edema right now, I would be breathing uncontrollably. <laughs> you can never get enough oxygen into your body. And it would probably take me about 20 minutes to walk across the length of this stage. So at 6,000 metres, to have that disease where the air is too thin for a helicopter to perform a rescue, it was pretty scary. It was pretty scary. But fortunately, two strong teammates of mine were able to assist me back down the mountain, back into base camp. Whereas a short-term, temporary uh, stopgap measure, I was placed in this red tube here. It's known as a Gamov bag. It's named after the Russian inventor. It's a sealed tube. You lie inside that bag. My buddy on the left there, he stamps on that foot pump, blowing air into the bag. So it increases pressure inside that sealed bag, effectively simulating a lower altitude. It drops you by about 3,000 metres or so. Now, it's a very restrictive space being in that Gamov bag. You lie there, you can't move your arms or your legs, and you've only got small little perspex windows to look out of. I was in that Gamov bag for six hours. Six hours. It did enable my condition to stabilise, but it's fair to say... I have a fairly severe uh, claustrophobia now as a result of being inside that Gamov bag. I'm pretty much terrified of everything, in case you're wondering. So it had stabilised my condition, but I needed to continue my descent down from base camp um, and back to Kathmandu and on, onwards to, to Australia to recover. And so I was quite dejected. Whilst the rest of my teammates were heading on up to try and climb to the summit, I had to leave the expedition. I took this photograph on the last day in the mountains. Normally, you'd get a great view of Mount Everest, but she was hiding behind the clouds all day. And I took this to be somewhat of a sign. It felt particularly sombre, and it felt like the mountains were giving me a message. Don't come back here, Pat, because you don't belong here. And so I got to the final bend in the path above a small town by the name of Nampshi, and the sun was setting, and I thought, this is probably the last time I'll ever be here. I don't think I'll come back to the Himalayas. I don't think I'll go mountaineering again. I'm going to turn around one last time, and I know that I'm not going to be able to see Mount Everest, and I'm going to take that as a sign to really put this idea to bed. And so I turned around, and as I did, literally for about two minutes, the clouds parted, and the summit of Everest poked through there in the distance. I thought, wow, that's an incredibly strong sign. That's an incredibly strong signal. Maybe I won't give up on that idea just yet. Little did I know then what I know now is that the, the clouds build up in the Himalayas every afternoon and burn off just on sunset. It wasn't any special message for me. But I gave that moment some meaning. I empowered that moment and I could subsequently reflect on this, on this moment. In many years to come, I always thought back about that moment when I was really, um, when I was deliberating, did I want to continue with my Mount Everest goal when I had various setbacks? I'd always come back to this moment and think there was, there was something in it for me. So I persisted. In 2008, I travelled to Alaska to climb North America's highest mountain. It's called Denali. She stands at 6,200 metres. Very cautious. It's going back to the same altitude at which I'd got the altitude illness. Anecdotally, the evidence suggests that 
if, you're going, if you've had altitude sickness once, you're likely to get it again at that same altitude. So very tentatively going back. Denali is uh, one of the highest freestanding mountains on Earth. It's a truly gigantic mountain. It's also an incredibly cold mountain. It lies only 100 miles south of the Arctic Circle. We climb it in the summer months. We have 24 hours of sunlight, but nonetheless, it's still incredibly cold. I remember one morning waking up in Camp 2, three of us crammed into a small two-man tent, and it was minus 20 degrees inside the tent, minus 40 degrees outside. Now, that normally really impresses my audiences in Australia. I get it that it's not going to impress you so much here. <laughs> However, when it's minus 20 degrees outside, you guys get to go home at night with central heating. Unfortunately, tents don't have that. Everything freezes inside your tent when it's minus 20 degrees, and so you effectively have to put everything that you need in your sling bag for the night. That includes your food, your water, toothpaste, sunburn cream, everything. Things that you didn't know could freeze, freeze. Everything freezes. An incredibly hard and long, arduous expedition, but fortunately I didn't experience a repeat of the altitude illness. And three weeks later, I was lucky enough to actually stand for the first time in my life on a truly big, big mountain. And I couldn't believe it. I was so thrilled, so happy to be there. Given my track record to date, I hadn't been particularly successful with my large expeditions. I didn't know if I was likely to be on the summit of any other mountains anytime soon thought I'd better make the most of this moment. So I've been bottling up all these, all these summit poses, which I've been sort of practicing in front of the mirror, but at last I got to reveal them to the world. So I was really happy about that. It would have been so easy to give up on that Everest dream after the accident I had on Amit Blam in 2006. But ultimately I believed in my vision and I stuck with it. Now, understanding your attitude to risk and your team members' attitude to risk, I think is, as I said, probably the equal most uh, important part of this framework in addition to the vision. Because ultimately, the mistakes that happen in the mountains are generally a result of flawed decision-making. This photograph here is taken on Amade Blanc. I subsequently went back there in 2012. It's Camp 3 at an altitude of about 6,400 metres. Looks like a pretty benign campsite. But when I saw this, I was quite surprised. At this very spot here, six years earlier in 2006, six climbs were killed here when an avalanche swept that camp away. And yet a couple of years later, people started going back and putting their tents there. That's where Camp 3 is on the mountain. On that little shoulder there, in 2006, this Serac, a Serac is basically an ice cliff, it collapsed fell off the mountain, boom, took out Camp 3. So when we were there, we were not prepared to put our tents there. You've, only, you've just got to be a little bit creative. So we found what was probably the only other flat piece of, of snow on the mountain, and we managed to stick three tents in there. We were simply not prepared to accept the risk of putting our um, tents any higher up. Again, on Manaslu in 2012, this is the sixth highest mountain on Earth. 18 people were killed here when they situated Camp 3 underneath Avalanche Pass of these Seracs here. 18 people were killed. So you've got to question what was happening in the decision-making process when the teams decided to put their tents there. This happens a lot in the Himalayas. So I got quite interested in the, in the concept of risk attitude. Uh, David Hillman and, and Ruth Murray Webster, two British psychologists, have been doing a lot of work around that. And the idea that there's not only a rational element to our decision making, we're used to being told, okay, just calm down, just relax, just think this through rationally. But that's missing the fact that there are two other key elements that we need to consider when we're making our decisions. We need to consider what our emotional state is, so we really need to develop the emotional intelligence around that. And also, we need to, if possible, be aware of these various subconscious biases that are going on in the backgrounds of our minds because these are what lead to flawed decision-making. I also love the idea of fast and slow thinking by two Israeli psychologists by the name of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. You might have heard of this as system one and system two thinking. But the idea being that we think in two ways. We think quickly, and this is the intuitive kind of thinking that we do. Examples of this would be complete the phrase salt and Straight away, I think even for you guys, your English is so good, you'd know you'd think salt and pepper. Whistle a tune whilst you're driving, you're not even thinking about that. Answering one plus one, you know it's two, it's intuitive. That's fast thinking. 
Slow thinking is more complex, it's more deliberate. So if you're trying to solve a riddle, you're trying to give somebody else directions whilst you're driving. Or to understand the ideas within this slide about fast and slow thinking, you're using your slower thinking, your more complex process. Now, the problems with um, slow thinking is that it's quite energy intensive and the brain was, has evolved over the years to, to be efficient. And so we tend to use our fast thinking more often, and this is sort of summarising it generally, but, but for the most part, we tend to become sometimes over-reliant on our fast thinking. The best example I could give you of fast versus slow thinking is to ask you, when I show you this next slide, which of the two lines is the, lo is the longest? And straight away, you probably think the top one, right? But of course, it's an optical illusion. We know that they're actually the same length. I can assure you that because I pasted them in. I copied the first line to the second line. That's an example of your fast thinking um, telling you something and then you're having to stop and actually deliberately think it through, bringing in your slow thinking. So I use this concept, I call it full spectrum decision making. And I reckon that the majority of accidents, whether they're in the mountains or whether they're in the workplace, result from us not being aware of our emotional state and not being aware of the various subconscious biases that can actually influence our decision-making process. So why are we back in Pakistan in 2004? Well, the story does not have a good ending because only two of us in this photograph are still alive. Very sadly, Inigo was killed on the descent of Kanchenjunga. He was climbing quite late in the day. His climbing partner had become incredibly fatigued and couldn't go on any further. But Inigo untied from the rope and pushed on to the summit. Radied in from the summit to base camp and he was never seen again. He didn't make it into his tents that night. The story gets worse because young Rob here at the age of 21, only two years after climbing Mount Everest, was killed in a climbing accident on a much smaller mountain, Mont Blanc. Now, once you've climbed Mount Everest, it's very easy to think that you're an exceptionally gifted mountaineer, but that's not necessarily the case. And whilst Rob was a pretty good climber, incredibly enthusiastic, the route that he was trying to climb, I believe, was, was outside his skill set. His ambition and his enthusiasm, um, so his emotional state, had overtaken his rational um, to think, uh, rational state of mind to, to really recognise that the route he was trying to climb was, was too dangerous. In 2009, I was on this mountain here, it's called Baronse. She's 7,200 metres high, climbing with my very good friend Lakpa Sherpa here. We got to about um, 200 metres from the top and we decided to go no further. It had snowed overnight and we felt that it was just simply too dangerous to go on. This video is actually shot at this point in time. Well, folks, this is the end of the road. We're at 6,900 metres on Baronse. And, um, yeah, end of the road. There's a summit there. We're only about 200 metres below it, but there's some serious terrain. Had a bit of snow overnight, and it gives me the <laughs> heebie jeebies being here. There's Amateur Blum out there. Uh, I can't even see what I'm shooting. Um, here's my feet. There's a long <laughs> way to the glacier. So you see the other guys coming out for a look, but I just want to get the out of here. So you have to excuse that language, but obviously I was somewhat in a heightened emotional state. But for me, a fairly easy decision to make, but a lot of other climbers may have been lulled into the idea that they're so close to the summit, that they've invested so much time, money and energy into their climb, that surely it's worthwhile just to push on, to tag the summit, and then they can be done with the expedition. That's a subconscious bias known as the sunk cost fallacy, where you invest so much money, you've already spent so much money, you think, well, I've got to keep spending. But if we can be... Um, aware of some of these tricks, um, we're likely to make safer decisions. My mountaineering career has been about essentially making small mistakes and learning from those. 
to the point that Mount Everest was my um, most successful expedition. I, um, I really didn't make any mistakes on that. It was primarily because of 10 years worth of, of learning um, on the job. In 2009, it was time for our final training climb. This is Mount Choi Oyu, the sixth highest mountain on Earth. She stands at 8,200 metres. Above 8,000 metres is an area we refer to as the death zone. Now that sounds a little bit melodramatic, but it's true. Human life is not sustainable above 8,000 metres. So I wanted to test my body out. Could I survive the death zone? And we do that by acclimatising lower down and then passing very quickly through the death zone. And I found out that I could. My body was, 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 um, was OK. And so back in base camp, I decided that, yep, I was ready to tackle Mount Everest. So how do we actually climb Mount Everest? Well, first of all, we set up our base camp at 5,300 metres. That's the end point for most people who are trekking up the Kumbu. But for us as high altitude mountaineers, we're going to go a lot higher up the mountain. Firstly, we pass through a route, known, a feature known as the Icefall. It's the most dangerous part of the climb. And this is where 16 climbers last year, including my friend Ang Shi, was killed. We set up our first camp and then our second camp at 6,500 metres. Our third camp is halfway up the Lhotse face. Lhotse is the fourth highest mountain on earth. We have to climb that mountain first of all. Our highest camp on the mountain is at an altitude of 8,000 metres. It's on the edge of the death zone. That's where we launch our final summit push from, tracking up the right-hand skyline ridge all the way up here until we pass over the Hillary Step and finally the main summit itself. Base camp, at the foot of the mountain, it's a pretty crowded affair these days. A lot of the commercial expeditions targeting the mountain during the one weather window annually, which we get during the months of April and May. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of demand for climbing on the mountain during this time. That's the ice fall behind us, a frozen river of snow and ice. We have to make our way through that, but incredibly difficult because of the high altitude, so not a lot of oxygen, and also the broken up nature of the terrain. So sometimes we have to use infrastructure such as ladders that we put in place to enable us to, 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 to cross these large gaps in the ice, which we call crevasses. Prone to avalanches, this is what an avalanche looks when you're in the ice fall and it's just passed through. That's about 700 metres down that avalanche has passed. In the ice fall itself, crossing a crevasse, this first one's not particularly bad. It's black, so it's effectively bottomless. But the next one is a little bit wider. So this is where we use a ladder. Now these ladders we secure with aluminium snow stakes and hollow ice screws, which are built specifically for this purpose. So it's actually a lot safer than what it looks. By the end of an expedition, <laughs> I knew that would get a laugh. By the end of the expedition, we will have crossed crevasses like this on about 120 occasions. Heading up towards Camp 3 now on the Lhotse face, we can see it starting to get quite busy as we zoom in on this photograph. It would take about nine hours for us to climb from this point here all the way up, up the Lhotse face into Camp 3. On the Lhotse face, looking straight up, always keeping our eyes open for rock and ice which can be knocked down from above. Looking back in the other direction, a pretty healthy drop to the valley floor. We arrive in Camp 3, getting very close to the summit now. From this point onwards, we start using bottled oxygen. This is one of the biggest risk mitigators we can use to enable our bodies to deal with the death zone. You can see just how slowly I'm moving here at an altitude of about 7,500 metres. If you count how many steps I take before I need to stop, rest for a couple of minutes and restart again, I think I get to four. Four steps and then I'm absolutely cooked. I'm going to rest like this for three, four minutes even before I have enough energy to take another four steps. So I'm going to break down 11 hours of climbing into four steps at a time. And then we arrive in Camp 4, the highest campsite on Earth. To we a fairly unpleasant scene as well. We said hello and we saw him coming 
you know, he was quite late behind us yesterday, oh. but, um, you know, we didn't think he'd sit out or not. The Mexican guys is actually, the story is too weak. Yeah. Maybe he, no more crime. No, yeah. Yeah, no energy. And he, and he just sit down? Sit down somewhere. Right. So he, but he got caught out between three and yeah. four, just yeah. below camp four? Yeah. In the night? In the night. And what's happened to his hands? The hand is, you know, the first part. Yeah. The hand is mold. Hand and mouth. Yeah. And fingers Maybe. black to where? Yeah, yeah. Fingers black. All is black. Uh, Maybe I think I, I can't see the foot. Maybe some torso on the foot as well. Yeah. Yeah. This mountain is not a joke. You yeah. Know? But unfortunately, a lot of these commercial expeditions essentially are treating the mountain like it is a joke, and we see these horrific frostbite injuries, very, very easily prevented. Black fingers, black toes. I don't know the end result of that, but probably would involve some, some surgical you know, um, cutting off of those digits. So in Camp 4, this is where we launch our final summit push from. We're going to climb through the night up to the summit and back down to Camp 4. It's probably going to take us about 24 hours. So it's a very, very long night as we climb through the darkness. It's very cold, minus 30 degrees. I've got five layers of gloves on my left hand four on my right, so I've got at least some dexterity, but you can see how difficult it is to unclip a carabiner from the rope and move it above an anchor point on the rope. But of course, the rope is keeping us safely attached to the mountain. It's an incredibly long night, incredibly cold. We're just doing an oxygen final changeover. It's about five in the morning. So once we've done that oxygen bottle changeover, we know that the sun should be coming up soon. And sure enough it is. And it's when you get that first sign of sunshine on the eastern horizon, you know that that long night, 10, 11 hours of darkness is coming to an end. It's the start of a new day and hopefully we're quite close to the summit. As we look out around us, all these other mountains that start appearing out of the darkness and we're higher than all of them. You can even see the monsoon storm clouds out to the right over here in a moment, flashing over the plains of India. Just an incredibly beautiful scene to behold, higher than anywhere else on Earth. I remember looking down into Tibet, more than four vertical kilometers at my feet, and seeing a light turn on, thinking, wow, there's somebody getting up for their day's work, and little does he know that there's an Australian just below the summit of Mount Everest. I felt incredibly moved and incredibly privileged at that point in time to be witnessing such incredible beauty. We pass over the south summit, so we're only 100 vertical metres from the top now. But here's the sting in the tail. The most difficult climbing on the mountain is that final 100 metres. Noticing my very dear beloved friend Ankaji here, highly optimistic that at 8,600 metres he's going to get some coverage on his cell phone there. And then this is the actual final summit ridge, a 3,000 metre drop on the right hand side, a 2,500 metre drop on the left hand side. So incredibly exposed climbing, incredibly difficult. You've got to really be very, very careful with every single foot placement that you make as you climb along this ridge. The final technical hurdle is known as the Hillary Step. It's a rock step about 10 vertical metres high. We came across another team of climbers who were descending, they had just summited showing signs of incredible fatigue. Watch this guy here in the orange jacket above a 2,500 metre drop as he lowers himself. Swings out, almost comes undone. People forget that on their way to the summit, it's only the halfway. The actual summit itself is only halfway. We finally take our final steps and then here we are. But it wasn't a scene I was envisaging but I'd actually have to Hello share it with 15 other Kat people here. at the same time. I'm calling in from the summit of Mount Everest. We summited at 10.30 this morning, Nepal time. Um, so that's about quarter to one in the afternoon, Perth time. It was quite a long climb, 13 hours, it was a lot of people, so it was slow going and it was a bit frustrating. Um, so these incredible but, views uh, from the very top, yeah, but a real concern for us is that there's a wind really starting to blow and that within about 10 minutes of us getting to the top, we're actually caught in a whiteout. So it's taken us 13 hours to get up to the summit. It will take another nine long hours of descent before we're back safely. 
85% of mountaineer accidents happen on the descent, when people become not only physically fatigued, but mentally fatigued. That is when the quality of the decisions made really, really deteriorates, and that is when you're most at risk. And it's no different to a work at the end of a shift or at the end of a, an offshore a rotation coming to the end of that period. They're fatigued. It's when we're more, most exposed. This is my favourite shot from the summit, showing Lakpa looking very small and cold. You can maybe just make out the curvature of the earth in the background. But as I said, within a few minutes, a blizzard had started to blow and we were ensconced in a total wipeout. So nine difficult hours of descent, very steep descent. Again, you've got to be very careful with every footstep, the slightest mistake, and you're going to peel about 2,000 metres down the mountain. It's only once you're back in base camp that this huge sense of relief really washes over you. And that's when you can, for the first time, just really relax and think, wow, we've actually done it. And I love this photograph. It's my favourite photograph, I think, from any of my mountaineering experiences. Only three days earlier, those of us in the middle of that photograph together had been standing on the summit of Everest. It shows you what you can do when you work together. When the individual and the team work together, it's amazing what can be achieved. That final element of my framework is all about thinking long term. I'd climbed Mount Everest, I was on the flight on the way back um, home to Perth. I looked out of the window, we're cruising through 9,000 metres in altitude. What do I see? That's the photograph I took, Mount Everest. Two weeks to the day earlier, I'd been standing on the summit of Everest, the same height at which this 767 was flying along. I thought, that's kind of crazy, that's kind of crazy. But then it occurred to me, what am I going to do now? I don't know what I'm going to do now. I hadn't really thought beyond that. I have a lot of friends who continue to push it harder and harder in the mountains. I think they're succumbing to the overconfidence bias. As I said, you climb Mount Everest, you think you can conquer anything. That's not the case. The more and more you go into the mountains, eventually you're putting yourself at greater risk. And so I'm a lot more deliberate and cautious around my mountaineering trips these days. My last really big climb was back to Amit Alam in 2012. And tomorrow, hopefully, you guys are going to come along to the workshop I filmed this entire expedition and we're going to be going through that expedition and reliving the events of what happened and analysing our decision making and getting you guys to decide what you do as each of these things happen. So what can we actually learn from what I've spoken about today? I reckon that we're at this point here, we've gone from improving our equipment, that was the first stage of moving towards zero harm, our plant. The second stage is about process. Our procedural management of risks and hazard. And then the third stage is all about the organisational context, so behavioural-based safety, where the organisation itself is trying to develop a safety culture. But I reckon that to get beyond that, to get beyond this plateau, I think we've got to focus on the individual and the team. And I think at the core of the individual and the team is that full-spectrum decision-making. It's not an easy thing to learn, but if we can make our workers, um, if we can teach them the basics of full spectrum decision making, both individually and in the team context, we can get better at pulling one another up when we're about to make a decision and it's flawed. So this is what I think can actually move us towards zero harm, using, of course, this explorer's framework, full spectrum decision making. I've written two white papers which discuss these ideas I've spoken about in more detail. So if you'd like a copy of these, please come up and see me. Um, give me your card and I'll, I'll send you copies of these. All the models and so on that I've presented today are, are within both of these white papers. So what I've tried to do today was to share my experiences, perhaps inspire you a little bit, but also to show you what we can learn, both the good and the bad, from other industries. As I said, in some regards, I'm always embarrassed to speak about the commercial Himalayan mountaineering industry because it's quite woeful. But as I said, I hope that for us last year, that accident um, in the icefall was, was the line in the sand that, that we dearly need. So thank you very much for listening to me today. I hope you've enjoyed it.